I'm about one thing, winning. A gente está sendo atacado. Hello, and thanks for joining us for this week's film show with our critic Lisa Nesselson. Hello, Lisa. Hello, Eve. Now, we're starting with The Brink, a much-praised documentary about Steve Bannon, who was the CEO of Donald Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. It focuses on the period after Donald Trump fired him. Now, documentary maker Alison Clayman followed him around for about a year in the lead-up to the US midterm elections. Some people, Lisa, are going to say that this film is old news. Oh, hardly. I wish we would spend more time examining the steps that led us to the present moment. I don't know how much of the director's frank all-access footage ended up on the cutting room floor, but uh, what's in this movie is very damning stuff. Trump is, of course, a thin-skinned, incurious narcissist. Bannon is smart, very smart, but obviously he also thrives on attention, lots of it. Steve Bannon is a name we should all be familiar with, like uh, Ebola or bubonic plague, you know, the sort of thing that spreads to formerly healthy people. Bannon comes out and says that without him as the CEO of his campaign, Trump would not have won, that his actions will still be resonating 30 years from now, and that Trump is a transitional figure. Well, yeah, the transition from civility to boorishness and uh, from respecting shared reality to fake news. Okay, well, let's take a look at how Bannon spins comments. George Soros. I mean, that is widely accepted as an anti-Semitic trope. The use, the suggestion that George Soros is somehow all, all controlling, that he's influencing Europe, everybody knows. I totally that disagree with that. George Soros is the simple. It's the biggest. It's not something to disagree with because it is an anti-Semitic trope. Well, what? No, George. That's just because you stated doesn't mean true. The idea that George no, Soros, George Soros is controlling the world is massive. I didn't say controlling the world. I said he's the, he's the financier and back of the NGO. So you're unaware that many people will read that as being a nod and a wink toward anti-Semitism. Absolutely not. I don't see that at all. So, Lisa, do we really have a Bannon to thank for um, convincing Trump to communicate via Twitter? Because I thought it was his first wife, Ivana, who gave him the idea. Ah, well, I won't be sending a thank you note to either of them. Uh, there's now a great deal of research uh, that points to the fact that social media use makes most people way more jittery and indignant than they otherwise would be. I suspect this is not a desirable quality in a world leader. He says that one thing Trump has taught us is that there is no such thing as bad media. Bannon says, I consider propaganda to be positive. Whatever nationalist movements uh, look viable, he wants to help. This is a mouthful, but Peter Bradshaw on The Guardian wrote, quote, what emerges from Clayman's film is how very important Brexit Britain is as a self-vivisecting research animal in Bannon's experimental thinking. So why do you think so many people take Bannon seriously then? Ah, well, you know, not unlike Jean-Marie Le Pen for decades here in France, Steve Bannon's ideas are abhorrent, but he presents them so smoothly that you're almost ready to say, sign me up, even if everything he say he says runs counter to what you actually believe. We see Bannon hosting Marine Le Pen's lieutenants in the film, by the way. I left the screening shaken up, and that lasted for a few days. Wow. Okay, well, now to a film from Brazil. Bakaru won the jury prize at the Cannes Film Festival in May. I absolutely love this. Tell us about it. Ah, uh, Bakaru is a futuristic Brazilian Western, a sort of genre mashup whose cast is primarily made up of people with really interesting lived-in faces. They're minding their own business in their village, when their village just sort of vanishes from the map. Satellites can't see it anymore. Let's just say some outsiders figure that if they behave really badly there, that's okay because these people don't really count and uh, besides nobody will ever know and if they do find out, well, they won't care. I'm being, you know, deliberately kind of coy about this because there's some surprises. It's a film that draws from several different movie traditions and that gleefully toys with our expectations as viewers. Okay, well, I interviewed the directors at the Cannes Film Festival here Here's how they describe the film. I really think it's a film about power, and power is something that I've been looking at in, in my previous films. I, I really think we made a war film. Um, yes. We, we, thought, we thought a lot about Ukraine in, the, in, in, in the 1942, in the Second World War. You have power, and then you have people who try to help power, and then they become enemies of the, of the common people. Uh, it's an age-old situation in life.
some really super actors in this. And um, Baccaro is more than just a movie, isn't it, Lisa? I'd say so. You know, ask any Brazilian artist and he or she will tell you that Jair Bolsonaro has declared war on art, on culture, and especially on cinema. No more funding. And just when you think it's settled that a healthy society needs certain things, farmers, engineers, doctors, scientists, and artists, a relatively slim majority of the population, 55%, votes into power an extreme right-wing strongman who can't see the necessity for artists any more than he can see the necessity of protecting the Brazilian uh, Amazon rainforest, three-fourths of which happens to be located in the area he's in charge of. So buy a ticket to this film if you can. Brazil's brave, now struggling filmmakers need all the support and encouragement they can get. And uh, this is a peculiar, original and entertaining film. It certainly is. Next, though, to French documentary journalist and organic restaurant owner Edward Bergon, who's directed a film based on his own life growing up on a farm. It's called Au Nom de la Terre, or In the Name of the land. Tell us more. Well, that sounds healthy and bucolic, but this film is actually a cri de coeur about the ways rural life and uh, agricultural methods have changed in France over the past 40 years. Pierre, played by Guillaume Canet and based on the director's own father, returns to France in 1979 at age 25 from a ranch in Wyoming to marry his sweetheart and take over his father's farm. When I watched this, I had no idea who the director was. This is his first fictional film or how the story ends, and I was very affected by it. I think it's an important story to tell. When people think of France, one of the things they think about is good food. But somebody has to grow that food. Somebody has to raise those edible animals. And Au Nom de la Terre is sort of a crash course in how agricultural practices have turned farmers into overworked, near slaves, prey to overwhelming debt and depression. The statistics about how many French farmers kill themselves every day or every other day, how many farmers go bust each week, are shocking. Okay, well, let's take a look at in the name of the land. Faut s'en sortir. Y'a qu'une seule solution. C'est de partir. Moi, papa, je prendrai la suite au grand bois. C'est fini, les grands bois. Si tu passais. Dis, quand reviendras-tu? Dis, au moins le sais-tu? Que tout le temps qui passe ne s'en rattrape guère. Que tout le temps perdu. Lisa, the vast majority of France's population used to work on the land. Now, apparently, hardly anyone does. What happened? Well, it's a very demanding profession and now almost impossible to get ahead. The problems in this story are compounded by the fact that Pierre has a loving wife and children, but a rotten relationship with his father, from whom he bought the land and equipment who, and who thinks driving a hard bargain is a form of moral superiority, even as his own son works himself to the bone. Debt and depression set in. Pierre's wife, Claire, manages to keep the farm going, do the accounts, but compound tragedy strikes. We saw a hint of it there in what was once a satisfying way of life, where hard work was actually rewarded has been transformed into a trap with conglomerates and banks insisting that farmers expand, invest heavily, requiring the use of pesticides and chemicals, and never paying a fair price for the grain or the chickens that result. Now, I'm a city slicker who think, hardly ever thinks about where the water comes from when you turn on the faucet or where the raw ingredients for the bread in the bakery comes from, but this wrenching tale made me feel more connected to the land, if only for a few hours, and the acting is excellent. Okay. Well, restored and re-released in French cinemas this week are three films by American independent writer-director Hal Hartley. Tell us about the Long Island Trilogy. Gladly. One of the most exciting things about the American independent film movement of the 1980s and 90s is that you'd see a fil film unlike any other you'd ever seen, and you'd go, yes, that's what's moving. This is so much fun to watch, and I, I, I would have hate to have missed it. Now, my dimples were sore from watching these movies again roughly 30 years after they came out. Hal Hal Hartley thought it was pretty funny that his still maverick, carefully constructed tales were shown at the recent Deauville Festival of American Film in the section called American Heritage. Hartley comes from a working class background and was drawn to film and music rather than factory work. The music he composes under the name Ned Rifle is infectiously good. His first three features, The Unbelievable Truth, Trust, and Simple Men, the so-called Long Island trilogy, abound in quirky, deadpan dialogue, great music, and an undercurrent of romance that's 
sometimes pragmatic, sometimes irrational, funny and profound. Hartley's movies are deeply American, but they appeal to Europeans. His deliberately stilted philosophical humor conveys a lot about family, love, work, politics, but it never forgets to be surprising to offer us twists and turns. And one of his subsequent films, Isabel Huppert, actually played a nun who aspired to write pornography. Hartley trades an absolutely sincere irony. Now, some people might find that disconcerting. I find it marvelous. His movies are little gems that still sparkle. Okay, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us this week. We're going to leave you with Hel Hartley's The Long Island Trilogy. Remember our website. We're also on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. <laughs>